they asked me to talk about what is propensity score matching, but as you can see, I've actually put propensity score in bracket. I will talk about matching methods more generally, and of course, uh, propensity score matching as a, a case uh, of particular interest. So matching, especially in its propensity score flavor, is uh, increasingly popular. And if you just, I mean, now I Google, yesterday I think it was already 277,000 entry, entries just by Googling propensity score matching. Now, an admittedly idiosyncratic uh, gay, uh, a way of uh, gauging the use uh, of matching methods is to look at the case, oh, sorry, as the case of PS match 2, which is a state routine I, I wrote at the beginning by myself and then with Edwin Leuven. And uh, it's been uh, downloaded uh, as many times, making it the 501st out of over a million uh, items in the Repic IDEA database. And by looking at the support emails I've received over the years, I can basically say it covers the whole uh, of the world and the uh, disciplinary spread is equally striking. Um, so matching methods are being used a lot. So what, uh, what are they? What is propensity score matching? Well, propensity score matching is the best available device for making two groups look the same, literally look the same. For having, um, uh, um, for pre-processing your data so that you have the observed characteristics of group A and group B who have the same distribution. They just look the same. The reweighted or matched group uh, has the same distribution of the observable characteristics of your group of interest. So I guess, Graham, I'm done. I've answered the question <laughs> and uh, we can go. No, of course. <laughs> so this is a clever device. It does this. And the question now, obviously, is when would you want to do this? When do you want to have two groups that look the same in terms of a bunch of characteristics that you have decided to, to balance? And uh, Mm, the, the use I mostly know of, and it's, it's really where it's been used a lot, is in terms of asking evaluation questions. So you have two groups, they differ in terms of a treatment. So some are treated and some are non-treated. And you want to know the effect of the treatment. Now, if you could just compare the average outcome of the treated to the average outcome of the non-treated, you might get you know, the impact of the treatment, but also you will pick up any compositional differences between the treated and the non-treated. So if the treated and non-treated differ in terms of any characteristics that affect the outcomes, you will pick this up in the, compa in the simple comparison. So matching is trying to purge uh, from confounding factors that you observe. So in, in order to introduce it more formally, I will start by uh, um, uh, in embedding it within the causality framework um, that is, is where it's really being used. And uh, how do we implement matching method? I'll give you a brief overview. Uh, should we use it? Advantages and disadvantages, especially compared to OLS, simple regression. And I will also have an application where I just show you some screenshots that will hopefully bring this more to, to li uh, alive. Okay, the counterfactual concept of causality. This is really the workhorse in applied evaluation work. We have the so-called evaluation problem, which uh, consists in assessing or measuring or evaluating average causal effects of a treatment of interest on one or more outcomes. Causal effects, I mean, effects is really redundant. We, just, we, we, are not, we don't care about correlations that we observe in the data. We are really after causality, and I'll define causality in a second. The treatment can be basically anything you're interested in assessing. Uh, it can be a government intervention in the labour market, like a training programme or uh, a, a, an employment subsidy. Or it can be an intervention in the labour market, sorry, in the educational programme, like a subsidy to education, the education maintenance allowance. It can be increasing computers per pupil or de, you know, decreasing the uh, uh, pupil-teacher ratio. Uh, it can be investing in a degree and your outcome is wages. Thus, you know, investing in more education lead to higher wages. Uh, it can be the effect of smoking on your health or on your children's health and so on and so forth. So you have a treatment and you have one or more well-defined outcomes and you want to know the impact of this. The potential outcome model, uh, as I said, is, is the one which is really uh, very fruitfully apply, uh, applied in this framework. It highlights how the outcome, which we call Y, um, may depend on your treatment choice, treated one or treated zero, and it does so by defining two separate val variables, 
uh, for each state uh, of treatment. So you have Y1, which is the value of the outcome if the individual is treated, and Y0, which is the value of the outcome without the treatment. So let's, assume, let's focus on saying the treatment is, is, is a labor market program, and uh, Y is earnings, and so we can think of the earnings if we participate in the program, and the earnings if we don't participate in the program. And the impact of the program, the treatment effect, is naturally defined as the difference in the two potential outcomes with and without the, tr uh, the treatment. So uh, earnings if I take the program compared to earnings if I don't take the program. Now ex ante, both potential outcomes are defined, but the moment the individual or anybody for him decides on the treatment, actual treatment indicator to take, d equal one if you treat it equal not, one of these two outcomes is revealed and the other one is an unobserved counterfactual. So the observed outcome will be Y0, the no treatment outcome, if you are non-treated, and it will be Y1 if you are treated. And X is a set of observed characteristics. Uh, they're called, uh, in various ways, like attributes. They're not affected by the treatment. They're like, you know, gender, age, depending, health, or depending on your, on your, on your variable that you have. So this is the model. Now, we, sorry, I said we are interested to recover average effects of participation in our program, for instance. So for who? Over who? Over which part of the sample do, you want to take, do we want to take an average? And there are three parameters of interest that the evaluation literature typically, look, typically looks at. And the first one is the most popular one. It's called the ATT, the average treatment effect on the treated. And this is the average impact, say, of the program for those who participate in the program. If our treatment is, say, uh, a degree, this would be the average impact of a degree on earnings, say the average return to a degree for graduates. So it, it's a relevant parameter if the treatment is voluntary, so it shows you the average payoff to an individual's choice, and it's also the relevant parameter for a cost-benefit type of analysis. Luckily for us, it's also the one that's easiest to identify <laughs> in the data and in the assumptions. Then there is the AT&T, the average treatment effect on the non-treaty, which is really the average effect for the people who have chosen not to take the program. And here the question is, you know, had uh, non-graduates taken a degree, how much more would have earned than they currently do without a degree? And then the average, there is ATE, average treatment effect in the population, which is unconditional on participation take-up, which is really tells you what the expected gain from the program is for a, an eligible person who is randomly picked, irrespective of whether they have chosen to, would have chosen to participate or not. And this is, question, yeah, sorry, absolutely. I'm, I'm a bit lost on the ATMT, which is the okay. average treatment effect on the non-treatment. Mm -hmm. So how, that seems a bit of a non-sequitur, because if you're not treated, then how can the treatment... Well, you can ask. Say you look at high school dropouts. Uh, people dropped at 16 without any qualifications, you, you could have said, oh, what would have been the return for them to getting an O-level, to getting O-levels before dropping out? Or you look at people with A-levels, and some have gone to college and some haven't, to HE, and they say, you know, what would have been the impact for the people who haven't gone to college? What would have been the, the impact for them to go to college? So it's the average treatment effect if they hadn't been treated? It, had they been treated, yes. Had they been treated, absolutely. Um, so uh, the ATE is just the weighted average of the two parameters. So, but why do we have an evaluation problem? Well, let's go back to ATT, average impact for the treated, is really the average treatment outcome for the treated, which as we said, we observe. So we observe the wages of graduates in the, gra in the graduate case, uh, minus the average counterfactual unobserved outcome that the treated would have experienced had they not got a degree. So we know how much graduates earn under a degree. This is observed, but we don't know how much they would have earned had they not got a degree. So this is an unobserved counterfactual. In the case of the at and we need to estimate the treatment outcome that the non-treated would have experienced had they taken the treatment. So if we look at people with A-levels who stopped with A-levels, they could have gone on to achieve, they did, and the question is how much would they have earned, would they have earned had they taken a degree, compared to how much they earn without a degree, which is observed. Uh, and to identify the AT, we need to identify both types of counterfactual, so we need to make stronger assumptions. And what we call the fundamental problem of, of causal inference is really the data do not allow you to observe or estimate these counterfactual terms, average counterfactual. So you need to invoke 
what we call identifying assumptions that allow you to identify these uh, uh, unobserved counterfactuals. And because they are, uh, uh, they are identifying assumptions, they are untestable, and it's really your, you know, it's up to you to claim and defend the plausibility of your assumption. So this is the general evaluation framework. How do matching methods come into play? Well, normally, the way, let's focus on the ATT to simplify the discussion. Normally, you would compare the outcomes of participants in the program to the outcomes of an appropriately selected group of people who have not participated in the program. And the best way to create this comparison group is by randomization. So the most reliable way to obtain uh, this counterfactual is to create a subset of the people who would have come forward to, to take the treatment and you just randomly deny access to the treatment to them. Like you run a randomized experiment. So you have, um, for instance, the program we will talk about is called the NSW. It's a program in the United States. People volunteered for it, so they all wanted to get the treatment, but 50% of them, because of a random toss of a coin, were denied access to the program. And so their observed outcome for the control group is the no treatment outcome and they can, we can get this estimated nicely and very robustly. Now, randomized experiments are rare uh, in economics. They, they do take place, but not as frequently as uh, we, we would like to, to assess various treatments. So in the absence of randomized experiments to, com to, you know, to construct the counterfactual, we need to somehow use statistical techniques to adjust uh, uh, the, uh, the groups. And the idea of matching methods is really to ex post mimic a randomized control trial by constructing a suitable comparison group which just looks the same as my treatment group. Now, of course, it can only look the same in terms of observed characteristics. So suppose uh, we want to assess the impact of my uh, talk on your probability of doing propensity score matching work in the next year. Now, obviously, you are a very selected subsample. I can't just go out and pick another group who hasn't come to this talk because they won't have your same interests, your same level of qualifications, motivations, and you're here listening to it and everything. So uh, we could have done that at the door, we could have tossed a coin and randomized half of you in and half of you out. And then we would have you know, uh, done this. Alternatively, matching says, well, we couldn't really do it. You would have complained and want your money back. So. <laughs> We, we can do that. We start with your colleague here and we go out and look for somebody eligible to come. So at least we ask for somebody registered for this and we look for a lady with her age, her experience, her earnings, her interests and her ability as measured maybe by exam and so forth. And then we match them up and then we go to Bansi and we go and look for somebody who just looks like her in terms of things that we think matter in terms of doing this uh, work. And then we move to all your colleagues and we match them up. We get your doubles there. But these doubles have not come to this course, and so we use them to, and we're going to look in a year's time at the incidence of doing this uh, propensity score work in this group compared to the incidence of doing propensity score in the other group, and then we say, ha it was my talk who did it, uh, who did any, who uh, gave rise to any difference. So when is this valid to do? Uh, it is valid to do under one assumption and one requirement. The identifying assumption for matching methods is that obviously this matching and pairing up of people can only take place on variables that we observe, right? We can't just, you know, m match people up uh, uh, if, uh, on, on dimensions that we don't observe. And, and this is really the identifying assumption here. It's called, has many names. Economists call it selection on observables. Uh, Leshner called conditional dependence or CIA assumption, uh, inbuilt exogeneity. Statisticians call it ignorability or unconfoundedness. But basically what it means is that all the outcome relevant differences between treated and non-treated can be captured, are captured in, in variables that we can observe and measure and go and get X. So in other words, once we condition on a suitable set of X, the no treatment outcome are the same on average for the treated and for the non-treated. And if we want to identify the AT and T, the assumption needs to hold in terms of treatment outcomes. And AT, we need to have both conditions hold. So basically this means that the evaluator needs to have access to a sufficiently rich set of observed characteristics such that once we have balanced the composition of the two groups in terms of these characteristics, we can claim that nothing has been left out which differs between the groups but which is affecting the outcomes. If you think a violation of this, let's think about 
you know, economists typically typically talk about ability bias. We think about some innate motivation or drive or commitment that, you know, if we can't capture this and this affects wages, then we, we will incur bias. So the first assumption is ruling out this. It's telling you, oh, maybe we're controlling for test scores at 7, test scores at 11, longitudinal histories, and so forth. This is really the assumption under which a simple OLS regression would get you an unbiased estimate. Controlling for X is all that matters. Now, this is an assumption. The second is a, a requirement, the common support requirement, to give it empirical content to the identifying assumption. So the matching can only take place on variables that we can observe, this pairing up of people. But it can only take place if we observe people coming to this lecture and not coming with the same value of x. Right? If you can't find anyone like your colleague there, we are stuck. And this is a common support requirement. We need to observe participants and non-participants with the same value of x. Uh, if this is the case, then we can use, so in other, for instance, YZTT means that for every X over which we're interested to make a comparison, the proportion of treated with that value has to be smaller than 1. It can't be 1 because if for X tilde this is equal to 1, it means everybody with X tilde is treated and we don't have any comparator to, to plug and get a counterfactual outcome for people with characteristics X tilde. Okay, now the idea of going out and finding matching people exactly on X is, is quite daunting if you think about it because normally the X's are a lot. Some might be continuous and you quickly incur in what is called the curse of dimensionality. So what OLS does, it imposes linearity in the parameters, so if you have K X's it only estimates K parameters plus your treatment indicator, but we don't want to go down this route. I'll discuss matching and OLS in a second. So matching methods really need to choose a distance metric, a multivariate distance metric that takes the distance between two vectors x with lots of variables and maps this difference or this distance in the two vectors onto ideally the real line, onto a scalar, onto a number. One way to do this is using the Malanobis metric. Malanobis metric is an extension of the Euclidean metric. I don't know if you remember from your algebra, but if this one is just Euclidean metric and it's a scalar, it's a number. Now this weights the difference in the vectors by the inverse of the various covariance metrics of x and it has nice statistical properties. Malanobis metric matching, as we will see in the application, can be very powerful. Another metric which has nice properties is the propensity score. So what is the propensity score? The propensity score is the probability that you are treated if you have a certain value x of your characteristics. So it's, it's a share of treated with a certain value of x or the condition driven probability conditional on x. Now the propensity score, why is it so popular? Well, it has two magical properties. In particular, the first one is magical and the second one derives from the first one. It, it is a property, so it doesn't require condition. It's not a, a theorem saying if, blah, 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 then. No, it's a property of the propensity score. The propensity score has the property of being a balancing score. In other words, what it means? It means that if I condition, if I take treated and non-treated with the same value of the propensity score, X will be independent in the two groups. It means they will have the same distribution of the full set of variables included in the propensity score. So if I take treated and non-treated with propensity score participation probability uh, of uh, 0.586, they will have the same distribution of age, of gender, earnings, all the variables you have included in the, in the propensity score. And, and I'll show you, it, it is true, I mean, it works, in most cases it works, it's a, it's, a, it's a beautiful property. So what this means is that you don't need to match people on the full set of x in order to balance the axis, you just need to balance them on one number between 0 and 1. And you will get all the distribution and the line distribution of x balanced in the matched samples, which is, is fantastic. Uh, another property of the propensity score which derives from being a balancing score is that if the conditional independence assumption, which was this one, holds given x, for free it's going to hold given the propensity score. So what this means is that, you know, if you are in a selection on observables conditional independence assumption framework, you just need to balance, uh, to balance the propensity score or match on the propensity score and you can interpret the resulting differences in mean outcomes as causal. Um, Sorry, I yeah. think keeps asking questions, but yes. the thing about the propensity score, so um, 
You're saying the distribution of all those factors is the same for both the treated and the untreated? Who have the same value of the propensity score. So you take the treated and untreated with propensity score equals whatever, 0 0.8588. In practice, you will have between, you know, you will have a band of propensity score. You need to have sample sizes. You can think of treated and non-treated with the same value of the propensity score as being a mini randomized experiment. This is a good intuition. So treated and non-treated with propensity score, participation probability equals 0 0.585. They have the same participation probability uh, as in a randomized experiment. And under the conditional independence assumption, they can act as treated and controls to one another. They have the same distribution of X. And, uh, uh, so you said it was a probability that the propensity score. Yeah, is a. If it says it's 0.8. Yeah, it means that given your characteristics, the share of treated in the in the sample, not only the population with characteristics, the one you have is 0 0.8. So your probability of being treated is 0 0.8. It is tricky, but you will see in the data, in the screenshots, if I get there, <laughs> that I, I just suddenly realized that I have so many things to say. It's a big topic to cover in, uh, in 25 minutes. Um, let me give an overview of matching estimators. This is just an overview, and, and I want to go into many details, but I will highlight many matching estimators. They all fall in this category. So the idea is you, you go, we want the ATT, average treatment effect on the treated. So to each treated, we need to match somebody. OK, so we take a treated I, and we do this for every treated, but I just exemplify for treated I, of course. So you pair to each treated I one or more comparable non-treated individuals. Now, comparable, it means that they have a propensity score close to the propensity score of individual treated I. And then you associate to the observed outcome, treatment outcome YI of treated I, a matched outcome Y hat I, which is given by the possibly weighted outcomes of the neighbors in the comparison groups that you have selected in the first step. So the matched outcome for treated I is a possibly weighted outcome of the observed outcome of J's in the comparison group who are in a neighborhood of the propensity score of individual treated I. So C naught of PI is a set of neighbors of treated I in the non-treated group, and it means th they have a propensity score close to the one of PI, and WIJ is the weight on treated J in forming a comparison with treated I. The various matching methods differ in how they define that set of neighbors, C0, and in how they define the weights, and I will give you now some, some examples. So just to conclude the general form, you can either, for the ATT, either take the individual contrast, YI minus Y hat, and average them over the number of treated over the common support, or you can just look at this term minus this term. You get the average observed outcome of the treated, possibly over S1 node, which is a common support, minus the average outcome of the matched or reweighted non-treated, which is this other term here. Let me give you some example of the matching estimators. Traditional matching estimators are one-to-one, -one, also called pair matching, and this is very easy. To each treated, you just match one non-treated. So C0 is a singleton, and the weight is one for the nearest neighbor and zero for everybody else. So basically, you, if the propensity score of the treated is here, you just look to the right and to the left and you catch the non-treated, which is nearest, and you match them up. Um, you can do with uh, or without replacement. So with replacement, it means that once that you can use a non-treated as a match for more than one treated. So you can have maybe very few comparable non-treated and you may want to use them again and again as match for more than one treated. Without replacement, obviously, means the opposite. It means that once you have used up a non-treated, you can't use the unit anymore. What is uh, the trade-off here is bias and variability. If, uh, if you match with replacement, you're really focusing on minimizing bias. You don't want to go too far away. You want, just want to get the best match every time but at the cost of increasing the variance because you will have treated that get, sorry, non-treated units that get used more and more. Uh, and the opposite, of course, is without replacement. The other consideration to do is, do you just want to do one too much mat matching or call nearest neighbor or impose a caliper? Impose a caliper means that this is your treated, you go and look right and left, but you want to impose a caliper around the propensity score of my treated, and is, you know, maybe say 1% either side or 5%, this because otherwise the nearest neighbor could turn out to be quite far enough, far, quite far. So this is a way of imposing common support. A second class of 
uh, matching estimators, which are called simple smooth matching estimators, associate to the outcome of treated I a simple a matched outcome which is given by the simple average uh, of the outcome of uh, multiple neighbors. For instance, why, oops, why doing one to one nearest neighbor? You can do k nearest neighbors, for instance, five nearest neighbors, or 10 nearest neighbors, or 20 or 100, up to you. What it matters is that if you do five nearest neighbors for your treated, you catch the five closest one, and then you get an average where you sum the outcomes and divide by five. So it's a, it's a simple average. The other uh, matching estimator is radius matching. Radius matching fi fixes a caliper or a radius around my treated, say a 5% or 1% distance, and then it looks for however many non-treated lie in there and just takes a simple average. This is radius match. And the final type of matching, which is actually quite powerful, introduced by Heckman and Coulthard, is the weighted smooth matching estimators. And this is typically kernel-based or uh, the extension local linear regression-based matching. And here, you associate to the outcome of treated I uh, a matched outcome given by the kernel-weighted outcome of the neighbors in the comparison group. So a kernel is, you need to think of, of the kernel as like a density. And so you will have that you have your treated here, the propensity score, if you treat it, you look right and left and you take the, non, the outcome of the non-treated, but if the non-treated are further and further away, you get them less and less weight. So you downweight, in forming the y hat, you downweight the contribution of non-treated which are too far away. You just have this bell-shaped kernel weight and it's, uh, uh, it's quite powerful. Um, the crucial thing is to check and ideally improve upon, once you've done your matching, the balancing of the observables. Okay, you've estimated the propensity score, maybe via a probit or a logit. Uh, oops. You know, you, you, can, you can really go wild here, you have more flexible or not, but th this is one choice how you estimate this. Then you need to choose how to match, and then you can check, you should check matching quality, and as I'll tell you in a second. And then if you're not happy, you can go back and re reiterate until you ideally find two samples that just look the same. Look, we are never looking at outcomes here, so it's not data mining. We are allowed to, to experiment. So we need to check that in the data, so remember, this was the balancing property of the propensity score, given the true propensity score in large sample, X and D uh, were independent, or treated and non-treated at the same distribution of the axis. So now we estimate the propensity score and we do the conditioning by choosing a type of matching and all the parameters related to it. We need to check that the distribution of X is the same in the treated and matched non-treated samples. And there are various indicators that you can use, like looking for each variable. You can look maybe at t-tests, standardized percentage bias, I'll show you. And you can also look at overall measures. I'll mention them when, when we get to the screenshots. How much time do I have, Graham? Yeah, okay, no, no, because I still have... Quarter two, okay. Yeah, as I go. Okay, uh, inference, okay, this uh, is still not, you know, completely set out in the literature. Um, my software displays a naive variance which ignores estimation of, of the propensity score in the first step. You can do bootstrapping, which takes estimation of the propensity score into account. You can also have, when we match on Malanobis, matching on X, uh, again, PSMatch2 displays the uh, heteroscedasticity, standard, uh, robust standard errors. And Abadian Inmans have actually written recently, uh, 2011 I think, uh, written down the formula for the analytical standard errors which take into account the estimation of the propensity score, but it's not been implemented anywhere in software. So inference is, uh, uh, there are still various ways of doing it. But, so what is really the advantage vis-a-vis -vis matching and OLS? Because Please understand that they matching and just ordinary least squares, they have the same identifying assumption, the conditional independence assumption. They all deal with observables only. And if there, is, uh, there are unobserved confounders that affect the outcomes and differ between treated and non-treated, matching will just be as biased as OLS. It's a question of internal validity. There's nothing we can do around it. However, compared to the simple uh, dummy variable regression model, matching is non-parametric and avoids the the misspecification bias which uh, the simple OLS model may incur. First of all, well, let's start with this one, it's non-parametric. Um, OLS um, 
specifies the regression function for no treatment outcome as a linear function in S, typically, right? X prime beta. And also OLS imposes that the impact of the program is constant. If you have a, you know, y equals x prime beta plus uh, you know, gamma d plus u, d is your treatment uh, uh, indicator, gamma is your impact estimate, and it's constant. Whereas matching allows for arbitrarily heterogeneity in impacts depending on x. But also in terms of the common support, so what we do with matching, we, we restrict estimation of treatment effects over the common support. Uh, and hence, we are forced to compare only comparable people. Whereas OLS might hide the, the fact that it's, maybe it is using the uh, functional form, it has estimated where it has the data over the common support to extrapolate outside the common support and thus compare non-comparable people. So if you don't have anyone with uh, high education in your data, you can't say anything about them, but still OLS might extrapolate and you don't really know what it is doing. Um, it needs to be stressed that uh, if OLS is correctly specified, it is more efficient. It's, uh, it's blue, the best linear unbiased estimator. So provided you have specified it correctly, if precision is an issue, then uh, OLS is, is, uh, is to be preferred. But you could say we don't need matching to make OLS less parametric, right? The identifying assumption of OLS is the same one as, as, uh, as the one of matching. The other assumption, functional form, homogeneity assumption, linearity, they are parametric assumption as such. They can be relaxed. So you can include you know, a general form of uh, interaction terms and higher order terms in the axis. And also, for instance, you can allow for full heterogeneity in impacts by interacting all the variables with the treatment indicator. Uh, and this is actually what another Stata Adu have written film does for you. Now, notice that it's not enough, like some papers would just interact, say your treatment indicator with gender and education and say, oh look, look at the sign, you know, the treatment is more effective for low education people or is less effective for females. But that's not enough. Once you allow for interactions, uh, then to get, for instance, the ATT, in this case, this is needs to be delta plus delta one, average X1 among the treated, plus delta two, average X2 among the treated, plus average X1, X2, uh, sorry, plus delta one, two, average X1, X2 over the treated. So you need to wait over the relevant group. Uh, and this is actually, it, it used to be quite, quite a lot of work, but film does it for you, so there's really no, no justification not to do it. I'm actually very fond of this. It's a very good bridge between OLS and matching. OLS, you know, the, the, the boundaries between OLS and matching are not clear cut. You can make OLS, you know, if you have a fully saturated model with all the, uh, and all discrete variables matching and OLS will be the same. The nice thing about this, you can F test for the presence of heterogeneous effects. You can test whether D1, D2, and D12 are zero or you can just look at single t-test coefficients. Still, can I ask something else? yes? Sorry, I'm trying to keep with you, but I'm finding it quite fast. I know I'm going fast. Um, OLS, what does it stand for? Oh, ordinary least squares. And so it's just a regression of y on x and d. What you're saying is that for that model, then you don't need any real people at all. It's just going to do it all hypothetically. It doesn't need the controls don't need to be real people. That it's just using scores and maths to kind of match a uh, hypothetical group of people. Uh, OLS? Is that what you're saying? No, well, o o OLS is um, it's just fitting a line. It's fitting a line over the outcome of the non-treated and then having an intercept shift to allow for the imp program impact. So it's, it, the line can be specified, maybe it's like parable or something like this, if you only have one x, but it's multidimensional. Uh, OLS just uh, minimizes uh, the residual sum of squares across, sorry. Uh, it's, it's just a way, it's just regression. Just a way of running, I don't know, how, you, you've never come across regression? Yeah, I yeah. have, but I'm stretching myself a little bit with this. Okay. Regression, so. Don't worry, Okay, okay. <laughs> right. Um, so the real advantage of matching compared to regression, which is really the, the competing estimation method, yeah, because they, they rely on the same assumption, is that you can check whether you can get the two groups balanced in terms of the axis or not. Think back of a randomized controlled trials. Normally we have the trial and then we just look whether we have the same average age and so forth. And this is what we want to do with matching. 
Um, strength and weaknesses, well, advantages, it controls for selection on observed and observed uh, uh, heterogeneous impacts in a completely non-semi-parametric way. We haven't, we don't need to ask additive separability, we don't need to re require exogeneity of X, we don't need exclusion restriction, distributional assumption, functional form, nothing. Yes? What do you mean by exclusion? Oh, sorry, it's, it's when we have instrumental variables, that's another, uh, it's another method which relies on this kind of assumptions. It means that you have a variable which only affects whether you are treated or not, but yeah. you claim not the outcomes. Why does it affect regression more than density score matching? No, no, this is just the advantage of methods in general okay. compared to competing alternatives. It's purely non-parametric. You, once you have your treated and you're matching on treated, you just take difference in means. Okay. So you don't make any assumptions uh, you know, about how the axis affects anything. Because of the focus on the common support, you compare only comparable people, and if you can't compare them, you actually understand, you know, you can say, well, no matter what I do, these two groups are just, too not, are just not comparable enough, and I can't, you know, these results is not, are not reliable, whereas OLS will just extrapolate and spit out an answer which is meaningless, and you wouldn't know, and if I have time, I would like to show you, but <laughs> I don't know. It's also flexible and easy to implement. So it's flexible, you can combine it with difference in differences, with pilot and control areas, and with other methods to improve uh, both methods. Uh, disadvantage as well, as a selection on observables assumption is in general quite a strong assumption, and matching like regression is as good as the axis uh, it uses. So you need to have a strong case where you think you have left out no confounders that give rise to bias. Uh, restricting estimation to the common support may change the parameter being estimated. So we want the average treatment effect on the full set of treated, but we can only get it for, uh, for those treated who fall over the common support. So we might get, if we lose a lot of treated, we might get a different parameter. Internally valid, an internally valid parameter, but not necessarily externally valid to the full set of treated. And then you need abundant high quality data uh, for the method to work. It's non-parametric, so th there is a price to it. Uh, I just wanted to show you an example, <laughs> uh, five minutes, but you did talk a little bit at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. We have to stop at half time. Far, far. Okay. So this is the impact of the NSW program, which is a very famous program. It was a randomized, it's a program that happened in the 70s in the US, which for extremely disadvantaged people, um, you know, lone parents on benefits, uh, ex-criminal offenders, ex-drug addicts, and high school dropouts. And it was evaluated using randomization. And then Lalonde took a, a PSID comparison group, which is a sam random sample of the US population, and was trying to see, saying, if we didn't have the randomization, could we get, uh, could we get the same effects? And the, the data sets contains like literally f few variables, age, ethnicity, education, and pre-program earnings. This, looking at comparability of group, these are the trainees and the control group. So this happened from randomization. These are the means, and this is a percentage bias in means, and these are the t-tests, and these are the overall indicators I mentioned before that you can check balancing overall. And you can see that, you know, the experiment worked quite well, although, for instance, in terms of not having a degree, having less than 12 years of education, the control group is significantly more well-educated than the treatment group. But overall, this is a p-value of likelihood ratio test that the axes are jointly balanced between the two groups. Overall, they are balanced. Now, if we look at the PSID comparison group, we, we are in shock because it's completely uncomparable. They are 10 years older on average. 25% of them are black compared to 80%. Look at the pre-treatment earnings. The trainees have very low earnings. The controls have 19,000. So, of course, uh, the biases are huge. All the t-tests are rejected and jointly they are rejected. Now, once we estimate the propensity score, the probability that you are treated, this is the distribution for the NSW treated, so the, the probability goes from kind of very small to kind of very high, 93% or 94. But look at the PSID. It really is zero for three quarters of the sample. What this means, just by stroke, but really a couple of lines of data or whatever software you use, you can really say that three quarters of the PSID comparison group are completely useless to our purposes. And Expecting simple OLS regression to compensate for these huge differences is asking too much. Now here is balancing once I do nearest neighbor with replacement. And look how, I mean, jointly they're balanced, all the t-tests are passed, and these are the reweighted or, or matched PSID people which have actually worked very well. 
And this is doing Malanobis matching. And please look, I mean, how beautiful they are. And in fact, look at this chart. This is the achieved balancing. I'm putting them on the, this is standardized percentile bias across covariates. It's minus, I put the same scale, minus 20 to 20. So this is randomization. I mean, it's good, but not great for the no degree. Uh, nearest neighbor with replacement, Malanobis, Malanobis augmented. Look at that. It's, uh, this is radius matching and this is kernel matching. So we can get the, the data balanced extremely well. Uh, what we can't do, for instance, sometimes it doesn't work. So I just do this example when it doesn't work. So now we want to get the average effect of the program for the PSID participants had they participated in it. Uh, we get an estimate which is minus 12,600. So it's like, oh wow, hugely downward bias. This is from matching. This is from doing a full interacted OLS regression and you see the estimate is pretty much exactly the same. Um, so we get from matching and from film the same reply saying, wow, had the PSID sample been sent on the NSW, it would have been damaged. They would have had a negative impact. Good that we didn't send them to it. Or is it really so? Now this allows you to look at the balancing before matching and after matching. Now, before matching, this is exactly what we saw, how completely different they were. Now, after matching, you see matching is struggling. We are, not, they had 10 years of difference, 34 to 24, now we are 34 to 29. 25% black in the US population compared to 80%, now we are 25 to 55. So matching is trying, but it's not succeeding at all, jointly or singly. So what we can say, and if you look at the characteristics, is that the matched NSW trainees who need to represent the counterfactual treatment outcome for the PSID are still too low quality. They're still, still sticking to the observables. We know that they will provide a downward bias estimate of the treatment outcome for the PSID. Hence, we know that uh, this estimate is meaningless, completely downward biased. So matching allows us to tell us this number is bonkers. OLS spits it out and we don't know. <laughs> and, uh, and in my experience, Every time matching has actually told me, no matter what you do, these groups are too difficult to balance, I went back and thought about the underlying evaluation question and I found that it didn't make any sense. Do we really want to know the impact that this program was sheltered employment for extremely disadvantaged groups that I told you? I know the PSID is a random sample of the US population. Do we want to send the US population onto this program? No. And then we can't even get the answer. So uh, the the really big advantage of matching, even compared to full interactive flexible model, is to highlight the actual comparability of groups and the reliability of the estimate and sometimes the relevance, the underlying question. Another case I was trying to do kind of mechanically, I don't know if you know this earnings function where you have log wages, a bunch of x's and then uh, omitted categories, no education group, I mean high school dropouts, I mean finish at 16 and then you have A levels, o le uh, sorry, O levels or equivalent, A levels or equivalent HE. So what you're doing, you're comparing, for instance, HE people to the base category, which is uh, people stopped at 16. When I was doing it, doing matching, I realized that no matter what I was doing, people who stopped with no course at 16 and people with a degree, they just could not be comparable. So that, uh, that question was not answerable. And then I was thinking, do I really want to know how much, what is the return to HE people had they dropped out at 16 without anything? Do I really want to know what the return to HE would have been for people who dropped out at 16? And the answer is no. So I could, I could get a reliable answer by looking at A levels vis-a-vis HE or uh, drop out with no quals vis-a-vis -vis O levels and so forth. And you can think as a policymaker, you might want to switch and move these groups. And the data was allowing me to answer this. Uh, so in my experience, when matching says, hold on, what are you doing to me? And you go back and think, like, okay, maybe I didn't really want this question that didn't make much sense.